Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and to all those who are online with us at this time or another time. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and for your love. Thank you for your strength and for your kindness. Father, we thank you for creation. We thank you for our lives here, and most importantly, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you so very much for the cross and the resurrection, Jesus. We thank you that you, by your power, have made all those who believe into your children. We thank you. Father in Jesus, we thank you so very much for your Holy Spirit, who's here with us and among us. And Father, now we just come and we ask and we request that you would work in our hearts and our minds this morning. That you might share with us and teach us what you would have for us and what you need to work in us this morning. Holy Spirit, be with my words. May they be meaningful and impactful and insightful, and that you might work through them for whatever purposes you may have for your body. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. What is prophecy, and why is it so important in the church? How should we go about ordering the structure of the church? These are key questions for us in a society in which you can go to any variety of churches and go to any variety of different ordering of services. From a more structured service like ours to a quote-unquote lower approach to church which is structured but more malleable, to services filled with charismatic tongues and shifts of the Spirit, what is it that Scripture says about these things? Today, our Scripture passage has one emphasis throughout all 25 verses, and it's this, the importance of intelligibility within the church service. The importance that people can understand what it is that is being said and spoken. This intelligibility is for the upbuilding, the edification of the church. So the fact that the service can be understood has one particular aim, which is the upbuilding and edification of the people therein. By the end of this sermon, I want us to be enthusiastic about the role of intelligible prophecy within the church service. So let's start here, what we're going to be doing today. Much of this passage is actually understandable on its own, so we're going to be hitting highlights and high points to give us the correct trajectory for thinking about it. We won't be hitting every verse, but we'll be hitting many of them to piece it all together for us in a timely fashion. So let's start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Now, Paul is writing a single letter, something that is going to be uh, meant to be a cohesive whole. When the original audience of Corinthians heard it, they heard the entire letter read at once. We have a sermon of a uh, sermon series of like six months, taking it apart and doing it bit by bit. But what we need to see is also the comprehensive whole, the connectedness in the letter. And so Paul, connecting 1 Corinthians 14 with what comes before, says, pursue love. 
He's talking and referencing back to 1 Corinthians 13, this object of love, and saying love and the ordering of love is what brings ordering to the church service. And love is by nature unselfish. It's not about one's own status, one's own promotion, about elevating a certain gift over another. It is out for the good and the purposes of the whole. Which brings us to the purpose of ordering the service, which is the upbuilding and encouragement of the body. And he says, pursue love. Now, if you think of that word pursue, um, we should really be thinking about, uh, you know, like a police chase. If anybody ever watched like one of those cop shows and you see the police kind of chasing after a suspect who's driving way too fast, then the suspect abandons the car and starts to run. And what do the police officers do? They get out of the car and they start running, right? They're chasing. And that is the idea behind this word pursue, where we are to pursue love. Now we know that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit is the one who works in us to build us to be people who are like Christ. And yet we also have a role in this. We are to pursue love. We're to go after it with everything we have. Not the cultural murky sense of love. We're talking about the love of God first and foremost, and then the love of neighbor. Pursue love. That's something we can do. But notice the second thing that we are to do. I know you're thinking this is not a summary, but we're going to dive in to the big points here. We're going to, we're going to summarize a lot of it, but this is some of the big points here. Pursue love and do what? earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Remember that it is God, it is the Holy Spirit who distributes each according to his purpose by sovereign dictation, the spiritual gifts in the church. And yet, we are told to desire those spiritual gifts. We are told to earnestly desire them. We are told to pray for them. Why? This is the big question. Why? So that we can take part in the ministry of building up God's kingdom. That is the why. The why is not about our own status. It's not so that we can feel good or pumped up. It's so that we can serve in love and power for the building up of God's kingdom. Pursue love. And in love, we then earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Notice this. Paul says this specifically. He says, especially, first and foremost among them. You want to build up the body? Here's what you are to especially desire. That y'all, the English is a plural. It's not you singular. It's y'all. It's you all. It's everyone that you may prophesy. Smile. Now, this does not mean that everyone receives that gift, but it's that everyone desires to have that gift. And he's going to go on. Why? Because that is so crucial for the building up and edification of the body. And the first question that we have for our practical application today is simply this. Do you honestly desire to prophesy? Do you honestly desire it? Or in your heart of hearts, are you saying to yourself, I would rather do anything than speak to another person or be in the place of speaking publicly before the assembly. What does the text say? Earnestly. That means genuinely, fervently desire to prophesy. Now then, your next question will, should be this, as we're thinking about it. What does it mean to prophesy? We've talked about this just in passing Sundays before, but I want to give a good definition. This is from a commentator on 1 Corinthians named Anthony Thistleton. And I'm going to say it, and then I want to explain it, but it's so good. Listen to this. 
prophecy is healthy preaching, proclamation, or teaching, which is pastorally applied for the appropriation of gospel truth and gospel promise in their own context of situation to help others. One more time. It's healthy preaching, proclamation, or teaching. It's something that we do. It's something that we say before a gathered body of people, before an assembly, or before at least another person, in which we are preaching, proclaiming, or teaching another person about the gospel. We are applying Jesus Christ, his life, his death on the cross, and the resurrection, and the benefits of his ascension, the benefits of all that, and we're proclaiming it and teaching it to another person. How many people, I I don't know, I'm I'm going to rephrase this, I'm not going to ask a question of all, I just want you to think. Have you ever been told, either behind your back or to your face, stop preaching at me? Right, you're one-on-one with somebody and you hear these words, stop preaching. Or stop being preaching. Or you even say to yourself, well, I don't really want to be preaching. You know what Paul says? Be preaching. Right? He's saying to you, he's saying in encouragement, preach the gospel. Tell people about it. Earnestly desire to prophesy. Earnestly desire to share and communicate with other people, whether gathered or one-on-one, but especially in the gathered assembly, the building up and encouragement of people by Jesus Christ and the gospel thereof. And he says, who's to do it? We're going to get into this next week, but it ain't just pastor. It's y'all. It's y'all. It's everyone is involved in this precious proclamation and duty of building each other up by prophecy. Now, we've got to go right to another practical application here because we can't miss this. If we want to be a people who prophesy, we must be a people of prayer and scripture. You and I cannot possibly be about that task in a responsible and spirit-filled manner unless we are so ingrained in the Word of God, so steeped and enriched in it that it comes up from our toes and out of our mouths before we think about it. You know, I'm not here. I want to be here. But they used to say of John Bunyan. John Bunyan was a Puritan, and he wrote the famous work, The Pilgrim's Progress, as well as a whole slew of other ones. But the commentators on his day would say this. If you cut John Bunyan, Scripture would spill out. What? It means when they were speaking with him and there were people with him, he would naturally be talking and alluding to Scripture without thinking about it. It was just so ingrained in who he was. And that is also what we are to be like. Because guess what, folks? Prophecy is never just about study, although it can be about study. Prophecy is about a life of preparation. So that when it comes time, the Holy Spirit drags out of you that scripture and applies it in the situation. Whether through meditated reflection beforehand, which prophecy can be, or in an extemporaneous way, meaning just off the cuff, God uses a life of preparation to then apply the prophecy in people's lives. So to be a people who prophesy, to be a people who earnestly desire this spiritual gift, to be a people prepared for when the Holy Spirit wants to use us, we must prepare. We must be in prayer. We must be in the Word, in season, out of season, all the time. Whenever we can get it, it must be input into us. Because what goes in is what comes out. Uh Uh-oh. All right, I'm going to go here. I'm going to ask, I'll ask for an apology. I'll give an apology later is the most that goes into us the latest sitcom 
Because guess what? That is what's going to come out of us. It is the most that goes into us, the daily news report and political discourse. Guess what's going to come out? That. The thing that should be most in is the word of God. You want to see victory in your life over sin, get scripture and the gospel in. And the Holy Spirit will give power and victory. All right, back to the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1. I hope we grab it. It's essential. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts that you may prophesy. Now, verses 2 through 5, we're going to start in on the summary aspect of this sermon. Let me read it, then we'll take some bits and throw it out to you and give it to you and then move on. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but God, for no one understands him or her, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Now, throughout church history, when we speak of tongues, there's been two main ways of interpreting it. We interpret it either as a foreign language, or people interpret it as a foreign language and a heavenly tongue, an unknown language, and they usually hold those together both. They can say it can be either or, depending on the context. Here, what seems to be indicated is a heavenly tongue. Why? No one else understands them. If it was a foreign language, you would expect somebody else in the world or somebody else in the church to perhaps understand them, especially in the midst of the Greco-Roman Empire. You have a port city like Corinth. You have people of all different dialects and speeches. You have people at the minimum of knowing at least two. And amongst Jews, it was three or even four languages, right? We see that today in Europe where people naturally know more than one language. The language should be known. So here, if they're speaking mysteries in the spirit and no one understands him but God, it seems to be something that bypasses conscious language and is something that is in the heavenly tongue or in a heavenly tongue. Now look, there's the aim of that is not to men, but to God. Verse three, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. That's why prophecy is to be in the main assembly. It has a function and a purpose. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. The one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be built up. What's the reason? Building up of the church. Where is tongues appropriate? In private. Unless... There is someone to interpret. Okay? Otherwise, not appropriate for the public assembly. Why? Only a person speaking in tongues is built up. No one else is. So what happens? That is something for private use. In the public assembly, it is only speech that can be understood. Okay? Now, what then is the tongues seeming to suggest here? The the, the best my commentators are giving me, and I think that this is true, is tongues is, is about being overwhelmed with the sense and presence of God and the love of God in such a way that the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but our spirit, prays, bypassing our language and simply speaking in unintelligible communication. Unintelligible communication. For private use... Not for public use, unless what? Unless it's interpreted. Verse 5 is fascinating. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongue, not about status, not about quality of gift, but about depth of service. Someone who is speaking in tongues, only serving themselves, unless there's an interpreter. Someone who is speaking prophecy benefits not themselves, but who? 
the body. We keep coming back to this importance. We're wanting to draw those dots because those are the dots Paul's, Paul is drawing. Notice this here. Almost every English translation says, unless someone interprets. The idea there is that there's somebody speaking in tongues and over here is an interpreter. You think my sermons are long. When I was beginning to preach, I spoke in a Chinese church service. And there would always be an interpreter next to me. And I would speak in English, and they would interpret. And you go line by line. Thought my sermons are long now, huh? <laughs> An hour and a half later, right? But anyway, so uh, that's the idea given by the text, is that there's somebody speaking and somebody interpreting. Actually, in the Greek, it simply says this. It's, very, it's a little bit more ambiguous. It says, unless he interprets. Implying that the person speaking in tongues is interpreting what those tongues mean and speak it. As in this, they're able to put into common language the love they are feeling from God. They're able to articulate it. If they're not able to, where does it belong? In private. Not in public worship. Doesn't build up the church. Why is this important, folks? I just want to make a real quick application for us here. If you are familiar with, with television preachers and things on TV or even the multitude of preachers on YouTube, you will see sometimes pastors start speaking from tongues in a worship service as if that was the sign that they were filled with the Spirit of God. Guess what this text is saying? Uh, inappropriate. Not to be allowed in the public assembly. Okay, why? Because they're not interpreting. They're not interpreting themselves and no one else is interpreting them. Okay, so I want to equip you for what is right in the worship service that is out of bounds. Verse 6, here's the explanation. We're going to start to hit even de deeper in summary mode here. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Unless I have something to say in with my words. If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? The idea here is simply this. If something does not provide distinct syllables so that something can be understood, it's irrelevant. The best illustration of this illustration is, have you ever taken a little kid to the piano? What do little kids do on pianos? They'll, maybe they'll pick out notes, or maybe they just go, bah, 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 right? But when they're playing, no music is actually being played. They're simply hitting the notes, and tones happen to be coming out. But very little is it actually intelligible for most young people. Okay, they just go, blah, 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 blah. But what do we want to hear? What we want to hear is our beautiful pianist music. Right? And it's a tone, and each chord is distinct, and each note is distinct, and so that we can follow along, and it expresses meaning and communication as our instrumentalists play. That's what we want. And Paul is saying that's what we should have in the public assembly. Why? So that people can respond in turn. Verse 9, so with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves... Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Again, it's all very plain. It's simple. It's about the intelligibility of communication within the church service. Again, Paul says this, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. What? What? The person who speaks in a tongue is to interpret that tongue, is to say in plain words what the meaning is. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. 
What this means is that not that our minds aren't doing something, but our minds have no production to share with another. Remember that the context is not about the self being built up. The context is about others being built up. Okay? And so this is the, this is the meaning. The mind has nothing to share with another person. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. What? If I pray in tongues, then I also need to translate it and verbalize it so others can understand. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Everything is engaged. There's no bypassing. There's nothing that another person cannot understand. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. Thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. That's Paul's confession. It's something that would surprise the Corinthians. They're unaware of it. Why? It doesn't do it in the public assembly. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. We're not going through it verse by verse. Why? The point is clear. Intelligible communication in the services. Now, verses 20 through 25 are very interesting, and we need to take a few minutes to teach here. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. What's it saying? What does it mean to be an infant in evil? Well, evil here is the idea of using the strategies of darkness for selfish gain. What's happening in Corinth? People are looking to use spiritual gifts like tongues in order to prove their own spirituality. Look at how great I am. Look at how spiritual I am. I have this gift and you don't. And Paul says, look, be not children in your thinking. What do children do? The context here is that children are more often selfish than not. What's the context of 1 Corinthians 13 and 14? Love, upbuilding, edification, giving of self for others. So he's, he's tying these things back in and saying, look, in your thinking, be mature about how spiritual gifts are used in the church. Verse 21, in the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Now, this almost seems like it's coming out of left field. Paul is both simultaneously quoting and applying this text. And he does so actually in a, in a means of paraphrase. But to understand what Paul is doing here, we have to go back to Isaiah, look at what is happening in Isaiah, draw that meaning forward, and then the rest of this will begin to make sense in these verses. Because the whole section hinges on understanding Isaiah and what's happening there. So please turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 28. Paul again is quoting verses 11 and 12, but with a specific sign and purpose. And we need to go backwards and forwards in Isaiah to get the context and meaning and then pull it forward. Here we go. Isaiah chapter 28, let's start in verse 7. The judgment is coming upon leaders in Israel, specifically those who should know God's word. Here's what they say. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. The idea here is that instead of studying the word of God and knowing it, they're getting drunk with wine. Instead of laying out the scrolls of the, on, of the books of the Bible on the table, what's it filled with? Vomit. 
So what do they do? They can't give proper judgment, nor can they understand visions. Okay, They're, they're basically useless. They're not listening to the word of God. So then God is saying, look, to whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast? For it's a pre- it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. What's the purpose? The purpose is this. Number one, there's no other person to teach it to other than the leaders. That's the idea here. What's God going to do? Teach his word to, to toddlers? The idea is God, God should be speaking to people who are leaders. What's the leader's problem? Verse 10, the word of God is spoken so simply and plainly they can't stand it. That's the idea. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Boring. Oops. How many people say that about while reading the Bible? Sorry, I just that had to come out. Little little stick for us. All right. That's what it was like for the leaders, the prophets and the priests of Israel. Now is where Paul quotes this next section. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose. Yet they would not hear. What's he saying? Since they didn't understand God when he spoke in a plain tongue about a message of rest and peace through his law, therefore he will now say the same thing in a foreign language. But what's it going to be? Verse 13, the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward, and be broken, and snared, and taken. The language of the foreigners will then be the same boring message that they heard, but this time it will lead to judgment. This is talking about the covenant judgment spoken of Deuteronomy chapter 28 and on. It's the judgment of God upon a people who would not follow his law and ways. How does he do it to Israel? Remember, this is the northern kingdom of Israel. He does it through the language of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians basically wipe them out and bring them into exile. The judgment, the covenant judgment of God upon them. That's the context. Now grab a hold of it, bring it into Corinthians, and set it down so we can understand. What's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? It's this. The sign of tongues, of unintelligible speech, is a sign of judgment upon unbelievers. That's how he's going to be using it. It's a sign of judgment. Look here in verse 22. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Now you almost thought that this would be backwards because he's just emphasized that tongues is something that's spoken in the spirit to God and is a benefit for that person alone in private use. But what's it mean in the gathered assembly when tongues are spoken? It's a sign of God's judgment, is what he's saying. It means that they have already bypassed the intelligible gospel and have moved on into judgment. That's the sign. Now watch this, verse 22. While prophecy is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers... What's the sign of? Remember, we're doing summary. Let's skip to verse um, 24 and 25. Then we'll come back to 23. 24 and 25. 
But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Prophecy is a sign for believers that God is in their midst. Why? Because unbelievers are convicted of sin and brought into faith in the gospel. And everyone then, including that person, knows that God is among you. Why? A work that only the Holy Spirit could do is there. What is that? The conviction of the unbeliever of sin and the bringing them unto repentance and faithfulness, worshiping God. That's the sign in the text. Back up to verse 23 and we'll begin to close. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your minds? What's going on? The tongues is a sign of judgment to the unbelievers, and the unbelievers are saying, y'all crazy. Now, think about this carefully. Have you ever presented the gospel to an unbeliever, and they look at you with a blank stare, and then call you inappropriate names? Or maybe they don't call you inappropriate names, but they're certainly thinking of it. I know I have done that. I've shared the gospel with atheists before, and they just smirk it off and wipe it away like it's nothing. What are they thinking? It's madness. What's going on with the tongues? Believers know that the expression of tongues in the public assembly is what? A judgment of God upon the unbeliever. And the gospel is unintelligible to them in plain words or in the tongue, and they declare it madness. But it's judgment upon themselves that they do. Right? We are not to bypass the grace of intelligible gospel to the person that can then bring them into the fold for the sake of judgment in the assembly. That's how all of this is being strung together and worked out. So what is it? Prophecy is for the building up of the body, the conviction of sinners, and the declarative sign that God is among the people. What are tongues? private use, spirit, um, a spirit-filled prayer, but then also what? Not for the assembly because it's a judgment upon outsiders and those who do not believe. What then is our practical application? Let's go over this again. First, pursue love and desire prophecy. In order to be a person who prophesies, we must steep ourselves in prayer and scripture. Number three, I want to. It's not a main point of, of, of the message of Paul, but I just want to bring this out for us uh, really quickly. Discussions with unbelievers must begin with sin and should not and cannot go straight to grace. In our, in our culture, we, we had things in the 1920s called the burnt over districts, and it's because preachers were preaching fire and brimstone and about sin so much that people were literally burnt out because of it. What that has turned into is an era of so-called grace where people present the gospel without first talking about sin. Both are wrong. We must begin with what? Sin. We have to begin with sin. We must begin with saying, look, these things are wrong and you are under the judgment of God because of this sin. And you need a savior. And God has provided the grace on the cross and the resurrection in order to overcome this sin. And the unbeliever has to first be convicted that they're actually in sin. And if they're not, they will never reach for the grace. They will never fully understand it. We so often jump to over here with Jesus being the Savior that it actually renders the gospel incomplete. And we're like, Jesus is your Savior. And they're like, well, of course I want to go to heaven. Sure, I believe in Jesus. And they run to that. But then what? Well, their life doesn't change because they think they're okay. 
And what do they need? They need the changed life. They need to be born again. And so we need to just understand that in the context of this. What Paul is saying in verses 24 is, first, the unbeliever outsider enters. He's convicted by all, count to account by all. The secrets of the heart are disclosed. And then, falling on his face, worships God. And that's also the order of gospel giving. Number four. The main point, intelligibility in the worship service is paramount. I try my best to explain all jargon, all uh, kind of technical terms. I'll try to introduce them and then explain them. But here's the thing. Even if I'm being unintelligible in my speech, speaking too fast or using too much uh, technical language or whatever, if the point isn't getting across, you also as a congregation needs to hold me accountable. You need to say, now it's my job as pastor to help you all grow. So we all should be reaching at least a little bit, right? That's, that's the part of helping us grow. But it should not be to the point where everything is going way over. Couldn't understand it, right? By the way, where we'll get to this next week is this is also the point of other people being able to prophesy at the same time. Because sometimes other people hear something clear, more understandable, or in a further explanation that is important for the rest of the body to hear. That'll be for next week. Intelligibility is paramount. Of course, in South Union, we do not have tongues in the public worship setting. Although if you are concerned about having that gift or something, or you need to talk with me about it, please do so. I can get you in touch with other people, or I myself can help you with that gift. Number five, be enthusiastic about prophecy and desire the spiritual gifts while pursuing love. I want to end where we began. Are you enthusiastic about receiving prophecy for the upbuilding of the church and the conviction of sent sinners? The text says, be earnest in desiring that. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so very much for your gift of love and grace. Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much for all the work that you have done and are doing among us. And Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would work with power. We pray that unbelievers might come to know you, the one true joy, the one true Lord and Savior. We pray that lives are changed. We pray that we as a church are built up evermore into your body, are built into maturity and grow and grow and grow in you. And that your light would shine from this body and from each of us as individuals to draw other people in to your glorious salvation and to your glorious kingdom. Holy Spirit, be with us. In the strong and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.